is fighting to change a Florida law after her 25-year-old daughter died in the hospital. 25 is a critical age in Florida. That's when you can become what critics of the law call a free kill. I just keep saying, how is this happening in the United States of America? It's been four months since Cindy Jenkins' oldest daughter, Taylor, died in a Florida hospital. Taylor was just a gift to the world. She was full of love and light. Everybody loved her. The gaping hole left in her mother's life is hard to put into words. <sighs> oh, sorry. Making it even harder, she says her daughter died due to hospital negligence. I just think what a senseless loss of a life. Taylor, a flight attendant who grew up in Clay County, had been out celebrating St. Patrick's Day in Orlando with friends when she was in a car accident. She was on her way home, sitting at her red light with her seatbelt on, doing all the right things to quote Florida Highway Patrol. And another driver branded her at a pretty high rate of speed. She was rushed to a nearby hospital where she was treated for a traumatic brain injury. So the Brain injury appears to have been a misdiagnosis. Jenkins says doctors failed to identify a torn artery in her daughter's pelvis until it was too late. All right, guys, what's happening? Swipe away. I got Cindy Jenkins with me today. Um, she's here to share, share a little bit of her story about a hidden law here in Florida. It's called the Free Kill Law. I've never heard about this in my entire life in Florida. Um, she has a little bit of a story to share. Uh, I found Miss Cindy just on news break and I was able to get her name um, and in the video and they said it, but I scrolled down into the reading section, found it, contacted her on Facebook and she was cool enough to do this. I have some things to share from her story with you guys and we need your help to maybe change this law with a petition and contacting senators. I have PDF forms. I have a, a petition link. But uh, Miss Cindy, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you and uh, tell the people how they may help you and a little bit about your story. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much for watching the story and, and taking the time to find me and reach out. I've lived in Florida my entire adult life. I had my daughter Taylor here in Florida, and she she's a native Floridian. She lived here her entire life. I had never heard of Florida's free kill law. Somehow it remains Florida's dirty little secret. Nobody seems to learn about this law until they lose a family member in a Florida hospital due to negligence. And then they're enlightened that, oh, sorry, you don't have access to the judicial system because your family member was a, is a free kill. So essentially, my daughter, she graduated high school here in Northeast Florida. She went to the University of South Florida in Tampa, graduated at 20 years old. And she said, Mom, I don't want to I don't want to go get a job right out of high school or a finance job. Her degree was finance. She said, I think I want to go travel the world. And I fully supported that because I had to go. I didn't get to go to college out of high school. I, I had a much tougher upbringing. So I always worked really hard to make sure that, that it was easier for her. So she calls me up. She says, mom, I don't think I want to go get a desk job. I think I want to travel the world. I fully supported that. And she applied for a job as a flight attendant. She initially got hired by spirit and she was just traveling all around, having the time of her life. And then COVID hit. But even through COVID, she kept working. She didn't get furloughed. And they needed people to work because there were people with health issues that were high risk. And then there were people with children or family members that were high risk. So she said, hey, I'm young. I'm, I'm single. I'm healthy. I'm, you know, I'm fit. I'm going to keep flying. And she did. It was supposed to be a gap year for her, but she loved what she did so much. She kept doing it. And about a little, a little more than a year before all of this happened, she transferred from Spirit to Southwest Airlines. And that's where she met the love of her life. His name is Brett. They had planned their entire future. I really like him a lot. I There were some boyfriends I didn't care for that much, but I thought I can see this person being the future father of my grandchildren. It was just, they had such a great bond and Taylor was at uh, just, her life could not have been any more amazing. She'd worked so hard for that life, really hard. And, and everything was going great. She has, or had a great group of friends. She'd met Brett, me and her little sister loved her to pieces. I've been a single mom of my girls since they were nine and five. They have been my reason for 
living, for breathing, for everything that I've done since I came into this world. And uh, now the, uh, real, real fast, I saw the TikTok uh, viral kind of trend, the video that was made as well when you speak of these things. So I'm going to mm -hmm. kind of uh, incorporate that video into this one and, and tell, tell them a little backstory about that as well. Um, okay, perfect. Yeah. yeah. But so we're ahead. huge Swifty fans. We're huge. We, we love Taylor Swift. Um, you know, so everything was going perfect. I had actually just made Florida 100% home base again. I'd been traveling back and forth between here and Nevada. But because Taylor was going to be settling down and I didn't want to miss anything. I wanted to be here for all of it. I had just rearranged my entire life. And I, I was the blessing in that is it was in January of this year. So I was here about two full months and Taylor kept getting Jacksonville layovers. She was based out of Orlando, but she kept getting Jacksonville layovers and we were spending so much time together. And I'm so thankful for all that extra time that we had together. Fast forward to March 17th. Um, I tried calling her that day and she didn't answer, which was not uncommon because she was always flying all around and, and whatnot. So she didn't answer. So I, for whatever reason, felt compelled to go over to Spotify and I pulled up the song I just called to say I love you by Stevie Wonder. And I text her that song from Spotify. Later that night, she texted me. She said, hey, I'm home now. I'm, um, I'm going to be working tomorrow, so I'm going to go to bed soon. And somewhere between that text exchange and the call that no parent ever wants to get the next morning, some friends had talked her into going out for St. Patty's Day because Taylor was a lot of fun. I mean, like she was just like, look, she was a smart, like intelligent, very responsible person, but she just had this fun spirit about her and she loved everybody. She loved community and celebrating. So some friends had talked her into going out to an Irish pub. She went out, she had one green beer with them. And then she said, hey, I have to go. I'm working tomorrow. I, I need to go ahead and light. I need to head home. And she left, got in her car. She and Brett were talking on the phone on her way home. Oh. And she said, hey, can I call you back in about five minutes? I want to run through Taco Bell and get some spicy potato tacos. She loved those. So Brett said, yeah, sure. I love you. I'll talk to you soon. And he never got the call. She had stopped at a red light in Orlando. She was sitting there, according to Florida Highway Patrol, with her seatbelt on, completely stopped, doing all the right things. And I'm told a distracted driver was speeding and not watching the road, and they plowed into her. Okay. Florida Highway Patrol rolled right up on it within three to four minutes of it happening, and they sprung into action. And they got her, the uh, ambulance was there, they got the ambulance there and got her to the closest level two trauma center within about 20 minutes or so of impact. Wow. Wow. That's where everything appears to have gone wrong. So this officer with Highway Patrol was wonderful. He stayed after his shift to try to track me down so that he would know that my child had been in an accident and that she was out at a hospital in Orlando. Uh, got the call the next morning right before 7 a.m. And he says, Taylor has been in an accident. I've been trying to figure out how to get a hold of you. I'm glad we touched base. I have a son named Taylor. I mean, he, he really was a, a nice officer. He says, I'm a parent. I would want to know. And he said, it was a pretty bad accident. So, you know, get here as quick as you can, but as safely as you can as well. So I start um, packing and, and getting ready. I call my aunt in California, who's a retired ICU nurse to run things by her. And then I show up in Orlando. It was about 11.15 ish when I pulled into the parking lot of the hospital. I go in, I get a badge, I go up to the neurotrauma ICU floor and a nurse greets me and she says, Hey, the doctor's in there working on your daughter right now. He's installing a monitor to monitor her brain pressure or her intracranial pressure. Please have a seat in the neurotrauma waiting room and he'll come and get you as soon as he can. So she brings me water and I go sit down. I'm just thinking, I can't believe this is all really happening. The neurosurgeon finally comes in walks into the waiting room, walks up to me. Once he identifies who I am out of all the people in there, he walks up to me and he says, "It's your daughter was in a really bad accident. Uh, she has hematomas across the front of her brain. Uh, I have a degree in special education. So I was following because I had to study the brain and, and yeah. special needs. 
So he says she has hematomas along the front of her brain. She, um, her brain is very, very swollen. Poof, there's no room. She's probably not going to make it. And if she does, she will never be like the daughter you knew before the accident. And then we just kind of looked at each other. I was processing. I was completely caught off guard because that was the first time I was told it was that bad. Yeah. Um, and so then he just shook my hand. He said, I'm so sorry. And he left. The other families in the waiting room started consoling me uh, and, and saying, telling me about their children's accident or their family member's accident and saying, have hope. And I'm just sitting there in pure shock. Yeah, okay. Finally, it allowed me to go back and see her. Um, I've never seen my child look like that. She was orange when I first saw her. And I was like, why is she orange? Uh, she just had this very weird orange tone to her. She looked lifeless. Uh, when the general trauma surgeon came in, I was just trying to figure out like what can be done. You know, I'm an action taker. Yeah. What can be done to fix this? And so when I saw the general trauma surgeon, I'm reiterating to him what the neurosurgeon had told me. And he says, yeah, that's right. It is very bad. Uh, we don't even know how much higher brain function she has left. We think the injury is calling, causing her brain to swell and swell to the point her brain stem, which is controls your basic functions like breathing and coughing and blinking, things we don't even think about doing. He said, we think that that's herniating into her spinal column. We just don't know. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, well, why is, I, I actually said to him, why are, can we do surgery to relieve the pressure and make room for the swelling. And he says, it doesn't work in these cases. And then I'm thinking, well, we don't have to guess about what's going on. We have, can we get her back into imaging and, and see what's going on? And he says, it would not change what we're doing to treat her. So it's unnecessary. So I'm like, oh my gosh, it doesn't seem like anything aggressive was being done. I'm just looking at my child laying there orange, lifeless with this thing sticking out of her head and thinking, why is no aggressive action being taken? So I'm contacting family members that are in medicine or have friends in medicine. And we're kind of figuring out how do we get her out of here to take her somewhere else so that we can get a second opinion. If we get her to another hospital and they just let her lay there and they, they say that they're not going to do surgery. Okay. But we knew what they decided to do at that facility. And I wanted to make sure I did everything. So we're trying uh, about 5 30 PM. I'm downstairs I hadn't really had anything to eat or drink all day the vending machines in the ICU were broken so I went down to the cafeteria to grab something to drink something to eat and I'm down there and I get a call from Taylor's boyfriend because he and his mom had flown in ASAP as soon as they got the news um, and he calls me he says hey I need you to get up here right away the doctors are in here trying to get Taylor's friends to sign consent they said she has a torn artery and they need to do surgery and if they don't, you know, he's telling me what they told him. So I hang up and I get up there right away. The doctor comes out and he says, Hey, Taylor has a torn pelvic artery. It's a really rare injury unless you've broken your pelvis or something, but she's so tiny. Taylor was like five, six, 110 pounds worked out all the time. He says, she's so tiny that the seatbelt must've caused the artery to tear. Wow. It's really serious. She's probably not going to make it through this surgery, but if she, if we don't do it, she's going to die. So of course they sign consent, they take her for surgery. She comes out, they tell us how well the surgery went. Like they couldn't believe how well it went. The vascular surgeon was actually amazing. Uh, he was a clear standout at that facility. But then they shift the focus back to this brain injury. Like we just think that the injury is causing her brain to swell and swell. We don't know how much higher order skills she's gonna have left. We think her brain stem is herniating. And this was the original diagnosis of the whole situation, correct? That was the original diagnosis. Okay. So when the doctor did rounds that evening, I said, hey, my younger daughter was with me and we were asking, how do we access her record? Because before I, my first step was, let me see what the record says so that I can take screenshots and talk to a physician at the hospital where I wanted to have her transferred. Absolutely. See what his thoughts were and see if he thought it was safe for me to get her transferred over. And this doctor just says, well, we don't, other floors in the hospital have patient portals, but and ways to access records, but that's not something available for ICU patients. 
So I'm like, okay. So he leaves and the conversation continues about us needing to get her out of here between a couple of my family members and I. And the next day, even our friends are like, we have to get her out of here. Like we have got to get Taylor to a different facility. I asked from March 18th through March 21st, four full days to see and review my daughter's medical record so that I could get a second opinion and have her transferred. Those are three Florida laws that are my right. And every time I'd ask, I was given the same statement. Our policy is not to give access to patient records until the patient is transferred or discharged. And I'm thinking neither of those things are gonna happen at this rate. Yeah. Monday morning, so all weekend, they have us looking at the pressure monitor. They said that 20 is the magic number. They're measuring like how much pressure is inside of her skull. They're telling us 20 is the magic number. We need to get this number, keep it at 20. It's bouncing sometimes as high as 40. So we're just like fixated on this monitor and hoping for the best with this monitor while well, I'm trying to still focus on trying to get her out of there. And uh, now I know at 6 p.m., because I got her record after the fact, at 6 p.m. the night she had surgery, that first day in the hospital, when they brought her out of surgery, the general trauma surgeon noted in her record that she had no signs of brain stem function upon exam after leaving the, oper leaving the operating room. That was not shared with us. We are like looking at these monitors, hanging on to hope all weekend. I don't know if they thought maybe it would come back. My understanding is when you lose brain stem function, it's not coming back. That's it. I mean, that is the final sign of brain death. Yeah. Whatever reason, it was not even disclosed that she doesn't seem to have brainstem function. They just kept saying it seems like it's swelling and swelling, that her brainstem might be herniating into her spinal column, cutting off oxygen and blood flow. So all weekend, we're holding out hope. And Monday morning, one of the surgeons who rotates through, a resident I've never met, this is a training hospital, there were people constantly in and out of there. He comes in when I'm sitting there with Taylor and he says, she's brain dead and we need to go ahead and conduct testing to, you know, we need to do the testing. And I'm like, whoa, what? Like all weekend we're holding out hope and suddenly it's dropped on me that she's brain dead. So I'm texting family members and I'm like, the doctor just told me Taylor's brain dead. I said, are you sure? He says, well, we'll do diagnostics and then we need to do the, the final testing. So I'm sharing this news with everybody wanting updates and I shared it on social media even. When you look back at my posts from when this happened, it's completely contradictory to what we know now and to what the autopsy showed. Really? Wow. So yeah, this is this is uh it's amazing you're telling me this and, and you're it's crazy that uh that it went this way, how you were treated, it really is. And I really hope people uh follow up with, with their senators and stuff, but I'll let you continue. Yeah, so that night, Monday night, another resident walks in, walks through the room. I've never seen him. He, he just walks in and he says, we're doing everything we can for your daughter. We give her about 24 to 48 hours, but only because she's so young and so fit. And I'm thinking, the guy this morning told me she's brain dead. So then I'm thinking, I really have to fight to get her out of here. I have got to get her somewhere. So I at least have either a confirmation that what they're saying is true or it's a contradiction and we can see what to do from there. Um, so I continue to fight. Tuesday, I really just needed, we had a ton of family in town that were there with Taylor and I had been there nonstop and I needed to try to get some help to yeah. get her out of here. So I, I was in the parking lot and on my phone a lot. I had been back and forth to the motel, just trying to have a little bit of break from the insanity. Um, I looped in an attorney and even the attorney could not get them to cooperate with even scheduling a zoom meeting so that he could say, these are her rights under Florida law. But while I'm away, these doctors are coming into her IC ICU room, telling my family members, we need to do brain death testing and we don't need your consent to do this. If we do the diagnostics and we do the testing and two doctors agree, we're calling it. So then I have the attorney helping me get them to hold off on doing that. Um, it was just the biggest nightmare ever. I couldn't believe it was even happening. It just, that five days that she was in there felt like 
five years. It just seemed like it drug on forever, but every minute was crucial because I knew her life was hanging on the line. So I thought, now I know they documented she had no signs of brainstem function on Saturday at 6 p.m. Anyway, they the 21st, they share with me that they did diagnostics, that Taylor has no blood flow to her brain whatsoever. And they did an EEG that showed no brain activity that they needed, you know, those tests are usually not wrong. And then they call a meeting that I go into with some of their staff. A neurosurgeon was never present. That first day was the only time I saw a neuros neurosurgeon or spoke with one the entire time. So I'm in a brain death meeting and there's no neurosurgeon present to share anything. And I'm pretty, I, I'm pretty intense and I have a lot of energy. I've always had a lot of grit because I've had to. I yeah. was pretty worn out at this point. I was pretty worn down. Um, and so I'm just listening to what they're telling me and they tell me two sets of physicians are going to go in separately. The first set's going to go in. They tell me all the things that they're going to do, the whole checklist. And that if there's no signs of life, then the second team of physicians is going to come in and do the same thing. And when they conclude that, if there's no signs of life, they're calling it. So they started that at about, oh gosh, about 5 20 PM on the 21st and it went so fast. I was in the room when they did it and it went super fast. And at 5.35, they said that they called it. So I left, I ended up coming, we did donate Taylor's organ side note. I felt like if anything good was gonna come out of this tragedy, I knew she would want to save other people's lives. So she ended up saving five lives through organ donation. Her heart was so badly damaged from what happened to her in that facility, it had to go to a 60 year old woman. Initially, the organ donation company said, Taylor's wow. tiny, she's five, six, like we might be able to put this in a teenager or like she might be able to save a child's life that would not live otherwise. And I was really excited about that. Um, not that I'm not happy it went to a 60 year old because I'm no spring chicken at this point, but I was really excited that it might save the life of a child. And then I'm told her heart was so damaged that they had to give it to a 60 year old woman because there's no way it would have sustained a younger person for life. Um, that speaks to volumes. What happened was that day from the torn artery, she laid there and bled internally for 12 hours. All the glaring signs of internal bleeding were there. She was identified as a bleeding risk at 4 a.m. And all of the signs of internal bleeding were there all day, but nothing was being done. And I know all this based on her record. So mm -hmm. around the time, so that why, uh, um, maybe is that why you said earlier that when you walked in at one point, she she looked like a little oh, like orange. Is that is that maybe a sign, maybe or well, it could I, potentially? I didn't research that, but what I now know is that brain injury was a misdiagnosis. Yes. Uh, they took a second head brain CT scan. They took the first one at about 3 a.m. And the doctor made a very serious diagnosis, even though he noted on the report that excessive motion and streak artifact limited the evaluation. He went ahead and diagnosed her with literally one of the most serious brain injuries that you can have. The on-call neurosurgeon was immediately phone consulted. The Florida standards for a level two trauma center per the Department of Health is that the neurosurgeon is to arrive promptly. He showed up about seven hours later per his note in her record. And by that point, they had realized a lot was going on. So he his note is at 10 a.m. And she comes out of the CT scan at 1040 and they realize she's in her liver, had what's called shock liver. She wasn't even getting enough blood and oxygen to her liver. The cells were dying off because there wasn't enough blood and oxygen flowing to her liver. She, her left ventricle had collapsed because there wasn't even enough blood to pump, make her heart pump anymore. So she's in heart failure, she's in organ failure. And the scan they did the second time showed a lot of brain damage that wasn't present on the first scan that's consistent with a hypoxic brain injury or brain injury due to lack of oxygen and blood flow. The injury, I, I believe, because I have an autopsy, the pathologist said there are no subdural hematomas. That first injury did not exist. Oh, subdural hematomas are like a balloon full of blood between your brain and your scalp, inside right. your scalp. 
inside your skull. And, um, and that was a misdiagnosis. So what she had is called a subglial hemorrhage. These are common when a baby is extracted during childbirth with a vacuum suction that will cause the veins that are connected to your carotids to tear underneath your scalp, but outside of your skull. And it causes a collection of blood. That's what she actually had. And that is known to cause babies or in the few instances, an adult sustains the injury to look orange. It messes with your bilirubin appearance. Okay. Yeah. So the neurosurgeon shows up, she's in heart failure. She's in, he shows up seven hours after being called about, um, they didn't know it was a misdiagnosis, right? So he shows up seven hours later and she's orange. She's in heart failure. Her organs are failing and she has extensive hypoxic brain damage per the CT scan. Wow. And somehow he looked at the two scans that were conflicting, one that had an emergency brain injury that would have called for immediate surgery and one that you can't operate on. It was just massive swelling and her brain was essentially falling in on itself from the swelling. Right. Um, somehow he looked at these two scans and decided to base a treatment plan on scan two taken eight hours later without doing any additional imaging. Um, I don't know why, only he knows why. And unless I have the chance to have him deposed in a court, I don't ever get to ask these questions. Yeah. I will never know. Why did you take seven hours to show up? Why were orders to place lines and monitoring devices in my daughter's body to assess her condition, not carried out for seven to 10 hours of ever? If you didn't have the manpower, why wasn't she transferred to another hospital? Like I will never have the chance to ask these questions ever. Because of, because of this law, this, 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 this law is very, very strange to me. It's uh, it is set up. So it is, it is, it's almost set up. Uh, I don't even know how to word this. Uh, it's set up like a way to totally protect um it's it's a protection for hospitals doctors but on the other end it is uh it leaves people like your entire situation which is which is you they don't get to be held accountable and it's wrong um mm -hmm. it, it's it's totally wrong and um I, it even they even have this thing set up first off the name of the law is just it, it's free kill law okay that that's it's it's named um it's just named awkward to me. And then, and then it's, it's stipulated to where I believe if I read it right, because she was single, uh, no kids and, and 25 and under, this is, uh, this almost gives a doctor, you know, it almost gives a doctor position in a position to where they can, they can murder uh, somebody. They, they could, they could kill somebody without being arrested or, or, any day in court with it, correct? Correct. Yeah. She had just turned 25 years old. Her birthday was New Year's Eve. So she turned 25 less than three months before all of this happened. Had she built, still been 24, I would have equal access to the Florida's judicial system. But every attorney I called, the first questions they ask are, how old was your daughter? She just turned 25. Did she, was she married? Not yet. Did she have children? No. And they would, I mean, I've called so many attorneys. I had friends out of state saying, there's no way this can be true. And then they're connecting me with attorneys. I'm talking to attorneys all over the state of Florida. And they're all saying, this, they ask the same three questions. How old is she? Was she married? Did she have children? We cannot help you. The actual state statute in Florida is 768.21, subsection eight. But it's referred to as Florida's free kill law. And as you mentioned, and Spencer Roach, a Republican senator here in Florida, he's very outspoken about this. And he says it does give doctors a license to kill because if you've messed up and the patient lives, you're getting sued. You're going to have a malpractice lawsuit. But if they die and they are a free kill, you can't, you're, you're free. It's a license to not have a lawsuit. You, you can kill a patient and have no recourse through the judicial system whatsoever. You told me there, yeah, there, was, there were some bipartisan agreements where the bill was gonna get sponsored, but they just never went through it. it. It didn't get a chance to get voted on. No, and this is a sad part. Like I'd never heard of this law. I, I, I wouldn't have believed it either if I'd ever heard of it. 
there are tons of families inside and outside of Florida that have lost their family member to this law. And then they find out that they're a free kill. These families have been doing news stories, marching at the Capitol. They attend county delegation meetings from September through December every year. They reach out to their senators, their representatives, lobbyists who support and defend these laws because they represent insurance companies and doctors and hospitals. I mean, they, it's not that they haven't fought the good fight yeah. year after year after year. Uh, and, and they keep getting close, but the minute, minute it gets close, it's just shot right down because most in our government are for laws that protect doctors, hospitals, insurance companies, and big businesses. It makes Florida competitive. Like yeah. what doctor doesn't want to come to Florida and practice medicine if they can kill about one of every two patients and they're all good. They don't have to worry about a lawsuit. Another thing we have in Florida is called the 51% uh, chance rule. Most states have a loss of chance doctrine, which means if a patient is in your care, if you're the treating physician and you mess up and you decreased that patient's chances of a reasonable outcome, you're liable for, you know, you can be sued for medical malpractice. In Florida, we have the 51% chance rule. The attorneys here that represent families who have lost family members or if people live and, and they can access the court system, um, they have to prove before they can even file a suit, they have to have a doctor certify that that patient had a 51% chance of um, a reasonable positive outcome, regardless of what the surgeon did. Right. So I've been told by these attorneys that they would essentially try to fight and say, oh, Taylor would have died anyway, because it was a serious accident. And they would have people trying to prove that it doesn't matter that they essentially let her bleed to death. They would try to say, oh, it was just so serious. She wouldn't have lived anyway. That's so we have free kill and we have the 51 percent chance rule. And. I think the fact that these laws are in place and the fact that lobbyists and politicians are saying, if this went away, if we did away with these laws, we would have a mass exodus of doctors out of the state of Florida because their medical malpractice would go up so much, they wouldn't even want to practice here. What does that tell you about the rampant level of medical malpractice happening in our hospitals? Yeah, so instead absolutely. of focusing on the problem, like let's fix the malpractice, they're enabling and protecting negligent doctors. What does that mean? If we could always drive 100 miles down the road and never get a ticket, we'd probably speed a lot more often, right? We wouldn't even have to look around and say, hey, I better keep my, watch my P's and Q's. This is how we're handling medicine in Florida. And uh, it's it's tragic. The stories I've heard from these other families, luckily my girls and I have always been healthy. Taylor just needed emergency care, but I never realized what's going on behind the walls of Florida hospitals. I, and they're I, yeah. It, it's crazy. You you also said that uh, you, when you were talking to that neurosurgeon, you you called. I think you said your aunt that works that, that, that is also in, in works in the hospital. Did, has she? Is there a law where she's from? Is this? Does she? Does she ever heard of this? No. This is just. Is Florida the only state with this law? Mm -hmm. The only state in the United States of America. We are the only state with any law, and this is the one that literally says you do not have the right to access our judicial system. I mean, there's no other state where you can't even talk with a lawyer and have them file a suit so that doctors have to answer for their actions and be held accountable in some way. There's no other state with this law. We're it. Wow. Well, Cindy, I, uh, I have, uh, I have your, your links and things. You did say that they, it, it seems to me as though there are people that do kind of take this forward and, and, and reach out and go to their, their local town meetings and whatnot. But when it, it, it gets forgotten, you said, and, and maybe that's because enough people aren't doing it, you know, um, it could be. Uh, I do want to help you get this law changed. Um, I was telling you before we started the meeting, when if you guys, when you're watching this, if you Google uh, free kill law, you will see this thing is at the top of the Google search on, the, on page number one, you know, so she's definitely, um, you know, made progress in, in this, but I just don't feel like the media has been covering this story. This is a, 
it, it is an important story and you, you know, you should be able to hold those doctors accountable. As you're telling me this story and everyone who's listening, it seems like the, it's a very stressful vibe. You're in shock. Um, you know, yeah. this, this is your, this is your daughter. It seems to me at, at, here listening to you that really you only have like a good vibe or positive vibe with the doctor that did the surgery. Maybe mm -hmm. is that is that true? Is that I, I feel like you kind of liked him and he was he was polite with you, honest with you, and yeah. and let you know up front with you without without you know any agenda, any hiding anything. You were dealing with neurosurgeon and, and this, this this guy over here doing the surgery, and then the 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 initial doctor who he shook your hand was kind of like very uh, blunt with you in the beginning. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't get the feeling that you had you had like a good vibe with any of those guys with that with that surgery doctor. And, you yeah, know, and he was just called um, as an emergency. He came in kind of at the, in the 11th hour when he was told, hey, yeah. there's a torn artery, we need you here. But he just, I felt like he was, it was just a different vibe from him than the others. And I'm just so passionate about getting this changed. And my daughters have always been my world. People only know about this if they've lost a family member to it. And I never, ever, ever want anyone else, number one, to go through what my daughter went through in a Florida hospital, but definitely if they go through it for their family, I don't ever want their family to hear, we're sorry, your family member was a free kill. Yes. Um, it enables, this law enables negligence. It protects negligence. The reason for it is to keep medical malpractice premiums affordable, but are we really discarding human lives so we can keep medical malpractice premiums affordable? Is that really our best answer in the state of Florida? It makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, that's that's there's that there's gotta be some more awareness to this. All right, Miss Cindy, I appreciate it. Um, everybody, I have a PDF form. You can down you could actually no, you don't have to print it out. They could just fill it out and email per instructions on that, correct? Yeah. So what we need is for people who have not lost a family member to this, we need them to do something. They are doing something. But Everyone who hasn't lost a family member, we need them to be aware of this. People need to know about this because it's a dirty little secret Florida's managed to keep. And we need every, there's 40 districts in Florida. We need every, per, like as many people in every district as possible to reach out to their senator and to Ron DeSantis and say, I just learned about this free kill law. I am not okay with it. So the document I sent you ha has instructions as to who to contact based on where you live in Florida. You just click the link, type yeah. in your address. It will tell them exactly who to click and send the email to. Page one is the directions of who to send it to. Page two is a letter. It's copy and paste. They don't even have to write their own letter. They can just yeah. copy and paste what's written, click it, paste it to the uh, website, hit send, and then pick up the phone and call the number. Page three is the one paragraph phone script of what to call and say. We need for these people to know that we are aware all of us are aware, not just the families that lost family members to it, and we're not okay with it. And doctors and hospitals need to be held accountable in any and every way possible, every time they're negligent. I care less about that attorney and whatever he feels and thinks about. That family has ignored phone calls. That girl used to live there.